Got it. Well, welcome. I know Anne um, Hussein can't be here today. She's um, got another commitment, but she wishes us well. I don't, hopefully we didn't scare her off with all of the blood sacrifice at the altar. <laughs> um, same with David too. Uh, David can't be here today either. Nope. He had a, another appointment. No problem. That's why we're recording anyway. Okay, I'm going to share my screen and um, we'll do a little slides and also to lighten the mood, uh, we're going to play a little game. Okay. Oh. One second. Oh, everyone's like, what? <laughs> yeah. okay. Can we have teams so if we don't know the answer, we can ask a friend? No, it's not like that. It's going to be a, uh, it's going to be easier. I promise. All right, here we go. I have to share my sound too. Okay. All right. You should see. Um, whoops, I'm out of order. The um, slides on screen. I just want to recap a little bit from last week, even though I think all of us were here. We're on Leviticus, and we're moving at pretty much a, of a of a good clip this time because there's a um, a lot of business to get through in Leviticus. It is the book that is most often taken out of context and is often misunderstood. So this is one of the reasons we're studying it. It is um, a great example of how desperately we need to have a dialogical approach and worry about that new big word, which means the um, how we negotiate with difficulty when we encounter it in scripture. Uh, it is the third book of the Torah, which are the five books that begin the Old Testament. Um, so it's right there in the middle. Um, the Torah means the law or the teachings, and this is certainly one of the best examples of laying down the law. Leviticus is not like no other book in the wilderness or legal tradition. That's from um, Holy Imagination by Judy Fentress Williams. The first sentence of Leviticus begins with the Lord spoke to Moses from the tent of meeting, and this will have implications for Moses's, uh, the end of his life that the next book will say the Lord spoke to Moses in the tent of meeting. So there's a little bit of a dy dynamic here of the Lord speaking, but not Moses is uh, a little bit removed from the storyline a little bit. So numbers will pick up with a full-on narrative. Leviticus is not a narrative per se, it's not a story. And a um, reminder that in uh, the, for Jews, the... Um, the books of the Old Testament are identified by the first important word in Hebrew, um, whereas the English names, which come from the Latin Vulgate names, usually have something completely different to do with how, how they were named. Um, for example, Genesis is um, Bereshit, which is Hebrew for beginning. Uh, and then in for Leviticus, uh, the word is Baikra, which actually literally means, and he said, but in this case, the he is the Lord. So um, the Lord says, so it's another good example of the way they're referring to it. It's, is, is the first sentence means a big deal. What is this book about? It's about the Lord saying things is one way to think of it. And on Sunday, my sermon alluded to the fact that Mark's gospel picks up on this tradition a bit. And um, I bet if Mark was not called Mark, um, you know, if it was taken on the Hebrew tradition, it would be called the good news because that's the next, um, the most important word in that sentence, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the son of God. Um, so anyway, Leviticus, Baikra, whatever you want to call it that's what we're doing right now, the structure again, that you're looking at, especially for those of us that are drowning in the blood of animal sacrifice right now, here's, we're almost on the way out. That's why we're moving at a clip. This first section is all about the rituals and instructions for making offerings. Then the next little section will be about rules for priests. We probably will start that next week. Or maybe today, who knows? Um, then there's a section about purification, which is a big deal for them. Chapter 16 is about the day of reconciliation, and I'm going to pause and talk about that in a second. Chapter 17 to the end of the chapter is all about a holiness code of kind of keeping your, your uh, community together in a um, vow of holiness. And then it concludes with two short chapters, one on blessings and curses and one on sacrifice. 
remember there's a big theme um, going on in um, the whole book of Leviticus, which is about atonement. That's an English word that means at, it literally is the two words at one put together and made it to. So it's kind of a funky little word that probably drives people speaking in other languages absolutely crazy. But for us, it means at one men, making things right again. The act of making a wrong situation right through sacrifice or scapegoating. It's a very significant theme in Leviticus and obviously has a huge influence on Christianity. Right. Great. So as I alluded to in the prayer tonight, much to my surprise, is Yom Kippur. And a few weeks ago, it was Rosh Hashanah. Can anybody tell me what Rosh Hashanah means in English? Anyone got to get it? I think it's their new year. That's absolutely right. It means <clears throat> head of the year, head of the... Um, Shana is, a, is the short word for year. Um, sometimes you say um, uh, Shana Tov means, you know, have a good year, like kind of like happy new year. Um, Rosh means head. R-O-S-H means head. So top of the year, literally top of the year, the first day of their year, exactly. I believe it's in Jewish terms, the year is now in, in the 5500s, if I'm not mistaken, 5585 or something. Um, I read some kind of, I don't know if it was clickbait or not, as I outed myself on Sunday, I'm a habitual clicker of clickbait. Um, <laughs> I also accidentally purchase ads a lot, um, sometimes <laughs> intentionally, um, on Instagram. And uh, one clickbait said that Jake Tapper, who's the CNN host, he is, he signs his checks on Yom, on Rosh Hashanah with the Jewish New Year. Um, I mean, like, like he puts the the Jewish New Year on there, and I think the banks accept it instead, oh. of, instead of 2021, which is a Christian uh, date, <laughs> since we're measuring from the birth of Jesus, even though we're off by six years. But that's another discussion for another time. Here we go. Today, today, however, always kind of within the same month of September as Rosh Hashanah, a, a really, really celebratory day, we have a very, very serious day, and that is the Day of Atonement. Yom Kippur literally means day of covering. Oops, I'm sorry. Uh, day of covering. Um, and um, be it begins tonight, September 15th, 2021, at sunset. All things happen sunrise, uh, sunset, and it concludes tomorrow night. So when I worked in Hollywood, um, it's a, in Los Angeles, much, much more. Uh, Pam, I'm muted because there's a lot of commotion coming in the background. I'm sorry. Um, there is, uh, uh, in Hollywood, there's a lot more of a Jewish population, certainly in Los Angeles. So um, was not, I was definitely accustomed to seeing um, lots of orth Orthodox Jews walking to temple um, from time to time. And um, the more casual observant Jew, or maybe the more reformed Jew, um, that I would work with. It, it was definitely a custom. I got used to it. Maybe some of you have had coworkers where um, on Yom Kippur that they were not at work that day. Mm -hmm. So it's a very holy day for them, a bit like our Good Friday. Um, hey, Greg, is it, is it um, the date, is it always September 15th or does it have something to do with the moon? And Yeah, or... it's nothing to do with that. I'm, I don't know mm -hmm. off the top of my head what it is. Okay. Um, it's a good question. Yeah, it moves. They but they both move. They might be tied together. Um, my kids uh, got it off from school um, every other year, and every other year they got Rosh Hashanah off. Like they switched it. Oh, 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 and but it also meant that you didn't have homework if you if. <laughs> so my kids love September. There's so many Jewish holidays. Very good. Yes. Does so, it make a difference on when Passover is? Uh. I don't know. I don't know, to be honest. I, I would doubt it because it's so far away, but it, yeah. could, it could be a certain number of weeks after, kind of like how we, we're counting the weeks after Pentecost. Um, it's possible. Um, all the more reason I need to get a rabbi in here. <laughs> Stat. My, 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 my limits. Um, it is a day, uh, I think this is really beautiful. This is also Judy Fingers Williams, of course, a day for a reminder of our fragility and humanity. God is holy, we are not. And that's also a good reminder of where we are in the Torah right now. It is a example of their um, 
in a, in a way, it's, it's a direct correlation to this idea of scapegoating, which we're already starting to get a little bit of with the offerings that we've read so far in Leviticus. But um, skipping ahead to chapter 16, which is it's itself called a day of reconciliation, same idea as atonement. That whole chapter will explain how this tradition of observing Yom Kippur came about and talks about, I think David was getting into this last week, about the idea that um, they would literally offer up all of their community's sins that they felt worthy of needing forgiveness for, and they would symbolically place them on this poor little goat or lamb and then send the lamb off into the wilderness to go, you know, encounter God and who knows what, get caught up in the storm? I don't know. More likely um, now, 2021, we probably think God had better things to do and probably just let, you know, the food pyramid take its, take its turn. So that led to them, um, there's a tradition of kind of sending the goat off a cliff. So they actually kind of push the goat off a cliff to take their sins for them. That's the idea of scapegoating, okay. All right, chapters one through seven are all about the sacrificing, which we do to some degree to this day in our worship, yes, in our Episcopal church. And you, you see it particularly in what we do at the table for communion. So in antiquity, I, I, this is a little bit of what we call cleanup, which is where I go back and do some homework um, in the first week and second week of our Bible studies and just trying to figure out what did I leave off. In antiquity, sacrifice, this is before the Bible came to existence. So when all communities were doing sacrifice and most of the Middle East communities or Near East were all doing a form of sacrifice. That idea of sacrifice was about reverence, thanksgiving, and it was a connected to divination. So the act of um, kind of participating in creation or being divine. So the same way that we often talk about in a very beautiful sense, how much we take a part in creation every time we, you know, conceive and bear children, um, you know, make music, do all the things that we create out of ex nihilo, out of nothing. Um, that's a very much our what, God, what we believe God intends for us to do to enjoy creation and get a little taste of what it's like to um, be a part of creating something. Not play God. Don't go, let me. I know you're probably going that far. That's not it at all, but the act of creating is very much a God-like um, act that is encouraged among all of us. So another way in antiquity to understand of being participatory in God-like things was to do these sacrifices. So one, you know, for example, one thing that sounds really rudimentary to us or really, you know, old school is that you would almost like witchcraft in many ways interpreting signs from the way the entrails or the you know the intestines or innards would would show themselves after you slaughtered the lamb for example um kind of almost like reading tea leaves but in a much more gruesome way in our ancient world and we did talk about this briefly last week it was important that the gods plural had to be fed as well they were they were had very many human uh, human attributes that all these different traditions put on not just Greco-Roman, although those are the most famous that we know of, these the way to please the gods was to feed the gods, keep the gods happy. If we get happy when we're fed, surely the gods get happy when they're fed, and that would keep us safe and protected. But Yahweh, the uh, Hebrew God, is different. Yahweh, underst uh, the Hebrews understood God Yahweh to demand sacrifice, but this is very important. I should have underscored this last week. Yahweh does not need sacrifice. And that's the distinction with Israel's one God compared to all of these communities with multiple gods. For example, also from the, um, the Isra uh, Israelite tradition, Psalm 50, if I were hungry, this is God speaking, I would not tell you for the, for the world and all that is in it is mine. So consistent in the theme of the Israelites is this desperate need to try to understand God and try to place God in a box like the other gods. And God keeps saying, I'm beyond any possible box you can put around me. And what makes you think I, um, and it is a dialogue many ways. What makes you think God is saying, I am to be treated like a human being. So 
This is part of the tradition. People are required to sacrifice, but Yahweh does not need the food. That does not need the sacrifice. So if that is the case, what is the purpose of sacrifice? And the reason um, now we're going to pretend we're in school, and I really do want I do really do want to hear what you think is the purpose of sacrifice, some of which I've alluded to here. I think the only way we can do this is to play Family Feud, okay? So here we go. I'm going to switch, stop my share, and I'm going to switch. And um, you're going to, I would prefer you to use the raise your hand feature if possible. So it's a little more fair, but let me um, pull up my screen. Hang on. There it is. All right. And I'm going to share this. And you can Gonna, and you're all on your own team. <laughs> and I know you're excited. I, I don't have the music, unfortunately. I can't, can't play the music. All right. On your marks, let's start the family feud. <laughs> right. So the question is, why do we sacrifice things to Yahweh, to God? All right. Show of hands. Let's hear it. What do you think? We're gonna. We're gonna. I saw Jan Cooey's hand first. I didn't raise a hand. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry. But I saw Sarah's hand next. Sarah, you have to unmute. How about um, to show reverence? To show reverence. Yes. Dun, da, da, da. Number one. All right. Next was uh, Mary Wilson. Um, to make us feel better. He doesn't need it, but we feel better giving it to him. It makes us feel better. That's a great one. I don't think it's on here. <laughs> oh, well. My printer didn't work, so I'm not, I think it's one of these. Hang on. Yeah, it's this one. It's just the way we do things. You know how sometimes on Family Feud, you say something and then they're like, well, it's not quite the same, but we'll give it to you. I couldn't give you an X, Mary. That's great. That's a good one, though. Okay. Others, uh, Brendan. Atonement. Good work. All right, where is atonement? Yes, I remember. Good work. Ding, ding, ding. All right, who's next? Let's see those hands. Uh, Leslie. Um, obedience. Great, great work. I think it's the second one. <laughs> uh, I can't remember which one it is. I think it's this one. I got it. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> what number two is. All right. Who's next? Who hasn't gone yet? Barb or Jan or Pam? You want to guess? My answers were taken already. All right. We'll keep guessing. All right. Anybody else that's already gone want to guess? Hmm. Hold on, I'm just lowering the hands to make sure. Okay, good. <coughs> All right, well, let's see what we got. Let's see what we didn't get. It's an act of uh, giving, so that's good. Yeah. And it's an act of worship. Okay. Okay. Uh, good. And then the rest of these are silly. But so those really those first five, although Mary's not quite wrong about the, the idea of just, you know, it makes us feel better. Love the smell. Oh, yeah. Oh, good stuff. <laughs> Can't get right away from that barbecue goat. <laughs> Me, <I was laughs> no idea. What else is there to do? Fridays, and finally, only priests know how to kill an animal. All right, thank you guys for playing. Great, great, great. great. All right, perfect. Um, I think that's. Oh no, here we go. So yeah, let's just to recap. Let me just show you the screen one more time. These are the, the uh, official reasons why the Hebrews were, do, were doing sacrifices, and that is to pay homage or respect. I think that's what some, um, Sarah, I think that was the very first thing you said. So excellent. That's exactly right. It's a sign of respect. So again, with Yahweh, we're not trying to feed Yahweh. That's a big difference. So we're at now, it's a little more difficult. Why are we sacrificing? And again, please. You are supposed to ask this question in your head on Sunday mornings when we do the Eucharist, when we get to the great Thanksgiving. Why are we doing this? Now, the clue is the extremely beautiful prayer written in our Book of Common Prayer or in the Enriching Our Worship series 
is telling you why we do these things, right? We're not telling God or Yahweh anything he doesn't already know. We are reminding ourselves why we come together on Sundays virtually or in person to do these things. Paying homage or respect, offering thanks, always good. The Lord's Prayer begins with thanksgiving, so that's always a clue of a good way to pray. Let's start with giving thanks. An offering of atonement for sin. We've talked a bit about atonement. An act of obedience. We offer sacrifice. I think this is key, especially I'm thinking about masks, mandates, vaccines, you name it. We were just talking about that before we hit record. We offer sacrifice because Yahweh asks us to. Because we have a leader and the leader, we elected the leader or we were born under the leader. And we the way a society organizes itself is because somebody tells us what our marching orders are. Yahweh asks us what to do. The hard, hard 21st century American concept. Don't tell me what I want to, what I have to do. I'll do whatever I damn well please, right? But I'm off my soapbox. And it is an act of worship, right? Which really could be all of these things put together. All right, let me just pause there. Any questions or pushback or wonderments? All right, they're ready to read. Let's read the Bible. Okay, great. Let's do, uh, we've left off, if I'm not mistaken, at the start of chapter five. Um, and I'm going to read, um, kind of march us through this part for a little bit, and we'll stop along the way. Um, there is something I meant to say last week, but I'm going to say it at the end of this section. So I'm going to read to chapter 13, I'm sorry, chapter five, one to 13. We're in Leviticus. Uh, remember, it's the third book of the Bible, if you're having trouble finding it. And we're in the middle of the long instruction about, um, about offerings on the altar. So here's where we were. When any of you sin in that you have heard a public adjuration, adjuration to testify and though, the, though able to testify as one who has seen or learned of the matter, do not speak up, you are subject to punishment. Or when any of you touch any unclean thing, whether the carcass of an unclean beast or the carcass of unclean livestock or the carcass of an unclean swarming thing and are unaware of it, you have become unclean and are guilty. Or when you touch human uncleanness, any uncleanness by which we can become unclean and are unaware of it, when you come to know it, you shall be guilty. Let's just take a pause right there. Those that did Genesis and Exodus might be primed to know what we're talking about here, but this is a little bit of code in English. It's a little softened. What are we talking about with human uncleanness? What do you think? Mary, you got something? No, I, that's, I was going to ask you that. What, what does unclean mean? Yeah, what do you think? I mean, I know it means got dirty. Anybody want to take a guess? Clean, but, um, Here's a hint. It's a patriarch, uh, patriarchal society. Well, I would say it's when women have their period. Exactly. Good job. So as we know now, that doesn't make a woman unclean. In fact, it means something quite more beautiful that the woman is available to uh, reproduce. Back then, they did not understand what was going on. They may not have necessarily made a connection initially in antiquity, before, way before this, that the things that are happening biologically with a woman each month have anything to do with whether she can conceive or not. But you, presumably, they figured this out over time. Regardless, if you're dealing with these carcasses of animals and there's blood and they're talking about the carcass being unclean, when you have a woman who's already subjugated, as long as time itself has, <laughs> the woman's already subjugated. If a woman is bleeding, I'm sorry to get graphic here, they would consider them, the priests and everybody would consider her unclean and for a, a long period of time, right? Likewise, this is in the New Testament, Mary, in Luke's gospel, cannot enter the temple for a period of time up until Jesus is christened, which is about, oh gosh, six weeks, I think, after his birth. Mary's not allowed in the temple during that time because she's given birth and therefore she's considered ritually unclean. Okay. Now, the difficult part for us today is we don't get between the lines of how women feel about this, right? And they may have thought, they may have been conditioned to say, don't ask any questions. This is just the way it is. But that's what we're talking about here, uncleanness, right? But uncleanness would probably go to a man that would have some kind of relations with a woman during 
a period, no pun intended, of being unclean, okay? So, uh, where, let's see, where we go, where did we go, where did we go? Verse four, or when any of you utter aloud a rash oath for a bad or a good purpose, whatever people utter in an oath and are unaware of it, when you come to know it, you shall in any of these be guilty. When you realize your guilt in any of these, you shall confess the sin that you have committed, and you shall bring to the Lord as your penalty for the sin that you have committed, a female from the flock, a sheep or a goat, as a sin offering, and the priest shall make atonement on be your behalf for your sin. But if you cannot afford a sheep, you shall bring to the Lord as your penalty for the sin that you have committed, two turtle doves or two pigeons, and a partridge in a pear tree. I'm just teasing one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. You shall bring them to the priest who shall offer first the one for the sin offering, wringing its head at the nape without severing it. He shall sprinkle some of the blood of the sin offering on the side of the altar, while the rest of the blood shall be drained out at the base of the altar. It, it is a sin offering. And the second he shall offer for a burnt offering according to the regulation. Thus the priest shall make atonement on your behalf for the sin that you have committed, and you shall be forgiven. But if you cannot afford two turtle doves or two pigeons, you shall bring as your offering for the sin that you have committed one-tenth of an FF of choice flour for a sin offering. You shall not put oil on it or lay frankincense on it, for it is a sin offering. You shall bring it to the priest, and the priest shall scoop up a handful of it as a memorial portion and turn this into smoke on the altar with the offerings by fire of the, to the Lord. It is a sin offering. Thus the priest shall make atonement on your behalf for whichever of these sins you have committed, and you shall be forgiven. Like the grain offering, the rest shall be for the priest. Okay, so there's a provision in here. There is mindfulness. It's almost as if Leviticus has kind of worked itself out after five chapters. And got to the point where we were talking about the best animals, the best the, the society has to offer. And now it gets to the point where what if someone can't afford a certain amount of birds? Well, that's fine. Try these other birds. What if I can't afford that? What if I am dirt poor? Literally bring in flour, bring in something that is, you know, meaningful to you. And if you're poor, food is meaningful. So bring part of your food. That's the point of a sacrifice. So they're literally bringing flour to make bread, bread with. So the point being, everyone should have access to the ability to make a sacrifice in the temple. Indeed. Okay, let me pause there. Questions or comments? Greg, <clears throat> Greg I just have a comment. In yeah. my, I'm reading from the CEB Woman's Bible, and yes. there's a whole the half a page is the chart and it says the chart of major offerings in Leviticus one through nine. And it has then the offering name, the material distribution, the blood ritual and the result. Wow. So for, I'll just do one of them. So yep. the offering name will be entirely burned. The material can be a cattle, sheep, goats, or pigeon distribution. It's entirely burned. The priest gets the hide yep and then the blood ritual blood on side of the altar and then the result is a soothing smell and also for reconciliation and they go through like grain uh, all, all this it's it's just really interesting and if i could figure out how to you know what show, show it i would but i y'all give me five seconds i'm gonna scan this and send it to myself oh. and I'll share it in the chat, okay? Give me one sec. I'm going to hit okay. pause on the recording. The Common English Bible, Barb's reading, and um, you can get that on its own, or you can get the Women's Study Bible, which is also um, uh, the Common English Bible as well, which is really great. You don't have to be a woman to read that, by the way. All right. So now, oh, sorry. Any other questions or comments, everybody? Feeling so far? All right, let's keep going. Um, anyone like to read verse 14 to the end of the chapter? It's just a few short verses. I can from the message if you want. Oh, that'd be great. Okay. God spoke to Moses. When a person betrays his trust and unknowingly sins by straying against any of the holy things of God, he is to bring as his penalty to God a ram without any defects from the flock. 
the value of the ram assessed in shekels according to the sanctuary shekel for a compensation offering. He is to make additional compensation for the sin he has committed against any holy thing by adding 20% to the ram and giving it to the priest. Thus, the priest will make atonements for him with the ram of the compensation offering, and he's forgiven. If anyone, if anyone sins by breaking any of the commandments of God, which must not be broken, but without being aware of it at the time, the moment he does realize his guilt, he is held responsible. He is to bring to the priest a ram without any defect, assessed at the value of the compensation offering. Thus the priest will make atonement for him for his error that he was unaware of and he's forgiven. If a compensation offering, he is surely guilty before God. Okay. Wow, all right. So the idea of uh, priests taking a little bit from the collection plate is not, not something novel done in the Middle Ages that caused Martin Luther to break away. It's, it's been happening as old as time itself. <laughs> so there you have it. But also back then, weren't priests being supported by their congregation? So that's part of it too, right? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I'm just kind of pulling this chart together for everybody. All right. Um, any other thoughts or questions so far? We're ready to get through this part, I can tell. Would anyone like to read chapter six? Uh, let's go verse one to, well, let's go to one to 18. And a, maybe a different translation, anybody? I can read it, but I got okay, the NRS. I've got the NRSV today. That's Unless great. you want me to, I can read it out of the New Living too, but I have it right oh, here. No, this, I, is, this is fine. That's great. Okay. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, When any of you sin and commit a trespass against the Lord by deceiving a neighbor in a matter of a deposit or a pledge, or by robbery, or if you have defrauded a neighbor, or have found something lost and lied about it. If you swear falsely regarding any of the various things that one may do and sin thereby, when you have sinned and realized your guilt and would restore what you took by robbery or by fraud or the deposit that was committed to you or the lost thing that you found or anything else about which you have sworn falsely, you shall repay the principal amount and shall add one fifth to it. You shall pay it to its owner when you realize your guilt. And you shall bring to the priest as your guilt offering to the Lord a ram without blemish from the flock or its equivalent for a guilt offering. The priest shall make atonement on your behalf before the Lord, and you shall be forgiven for any of the things that one may do and incur guilt thereby. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Command Aaron and his sons, saying, this is the ritual of the burnt offering. The burnt offering itself shall remain on the hearth upon the altar all night until the morning, while the fire on the altar shall be kept burning. The priest shall put on his linen vestments after putting on his linen undergarments next to his body. And he shall take up the ashes to which the fire has reduced the burnt offering on the altar and place them beside the altar. Then he shall take off his vestments and put on other garments and carry the ashes out to a clean place outside the camp. The fire on the altar shall be kept burning. It shall not go out. Every morning the priest shall add wood to it, lay out the burnt offering on it and turn into smoke the fat pieces of the offering of well-being. A perpetual fire, fire shall be kept burning on the altar. It shall not go out. This is the ritual of the grain offering. The sons of Aaron shall offer it before the Lord in front of the altar. They shall take from it a handful of the choice flour and oil of the grain offering with all the frankincense that is on the offering. And they shall turn its memorial portion into smoke on the altar as a pleasing odor to the Lord. Aaron his son shall eat what is left of it. It shall be eaten as unleavened cakes in a holy place. In the court of 
the tent of meeting, they shall eat it. It shall not be baked with leaven. I have given it as their portion of my offerings by fire. It is most holy like the sin offering and the guilt offering. Every male among the descendants of Aaron shall eat of it as their perpetual due throughout your generations from the Lord's offerings by fire. Anything that touches them shall become holy. Perfect. Thank you. So a little more, just, you know, ancillary instructions for um, the priests and the Aaron, Aaron and his sons. This is probably a good time. I, I think I mentioned it briefly, but I'm going to try to pull up some images for you that in Lent. So, you know, again, with the kind of the, 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 the shadow of Yom Kippur and atonement hanging over us today or hanging over our Jewish brothers and sisters today. But, um, our version of that, you know, if, if it was one day is Good Friday, but probably better said is, is the entirety of Lent. And um, everybody know what color we normally use in Lent? Purple. Purple, right. And there's another color that's an option that some Episcopal churches do, but not everybody. And they call it Lenten Array. And I'm going to try to bring up a picture of it. Well, I'll just show you this whole screen. Why not? Um, Lenten Array is supposed to be linen. So, you know, if not actually linen, a linen color, but it should actually be linen. It should be um, a red that's a particular red that is not the same red as we see on Pentecost or Palm Sunday, but a red that's called, that is referred to as oxblood red. So uh -huh. again, you can't say that we don't pull some from still to this day from some of these traditions. Here's one that really goes there. Um, you see they put the crown of thorns on top too. So I guess you could use this oxblood red for, or look at this one, wow. This is some really stunning, beautiful stuff. Uh, my church, uh, my church, my church from um, Los Angeles that was my sponsoring parish used Lenten array for um, for Lent for a long time as well. So I-, and I we, we don't have those colors, Greg? We don't. We have white with with red, but it's a celebratory white and red. It's not okay. it's not this. So, our Mary's making notes for future uh, vestments. Um, could you send me that? Yes, I, I remember ox blood red. It's but very ox blood red. You just it. sent me a. Exactly. So we could, we're looking for things to do. So that might be besides our baby quotes. That might be good. Killing two birds with one stone and that I actually do mean that pun intended because we're killing two turtle doves with one sacrifice aren't we so Greg when you when you say linen the cloth itself has to be a linen cloth rather than like a cotton or poly so so it's a different cloth as well as the it's color because think of linen linen is a cheaper fabric it's supposed to be a, a, about humility right so you're using a very, very simple fabric that that has that kind of woven texture to it. You know, that like so like, would would your in addition to the altar covering, uh, are your vestments also supposed to be that too? Yes, mm. they they ought to be. The whole the whole thing should all be of a piece. Absolutely. So that's a pretty stiff order for the liturgical arts committee, Mary. But I'm I'm supportive of it, and I'm sure we can afford it too. <laughs> fabrics and all but I'll, i will do some research on it i mean it did, i didn't even think about this i was not planning to talk about this until they mentioned linen and then i was remembering linen and oxblood yeah i mean it's really beautiful and again but the, what's the point what are we always trying to do in lent that's not unlike what jews are trying to do today or tonight and tomorrow which is get people to take a break and remember that you're not god god is holy and we are not and and embrace that agility and humanity and and then walk the six weeks to good friday you know in the ultimate scapegoating of giving letting christ take on our sins again or reenacting in many ways re, re revisiting how christ became the ultimate and final scapegoat i do mean final because we're any act of confession of sin now is to get is to relieve ourselves of this burden Christ has taken on the true sin forgiveness already. Okay. Does that make sense? I know I'm skipping into Christianity a little bit. 
So anyway, the Lenten array thing, the whole reason you do vestments is to set a mood. I mean, that's what, that's what I would do. No, mm -hmm. not unlike what, how your lighting is and what your music choices are. And we're trying to set a mood to get people to think about what kind of season we're in and what kind of, what kind of mood you should be in. Purple is always about royalty. And yet the purple in, in Lent partly means it's, you know, kind of reminding you that Jesus's royalty is not of the, of the kind that we've, norm, we've been conditioned to expect up until that point. We're thinking resplendent king, and actually it's an ironic use of purple in Lent. So purple is predominantly what you see in Lent, and it's the marker of penitence. It's what a priest wears when they hear confessions individually. They wear purple but Lenten Array is completely usable. None of these things are in our prayer book. It's all tradition. It's all tradition. It's not in our canons or anything like that. It's, just bad it's really just bad practice if you're to walk in and have, I don't know, green on Holy Week, for example, you know, it's just not what you do. So I think I do take the colors and the, and the paraments and the altar very seriously, actually, in my own piety and in the fact that I feel like I'm trying to set a set a tone for all of us, you know. That's what I tried to at least. Okay, I got it, Greg. You got it? I got it down. So <laughs> great. You're on a quilting retreat right now. But. Okay, fantastic. Wait till they find out what we've been coming up with. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Let's get out of the priest stuff. How about that? And move on to, well, we're probably going to be more priest stuff. So we're in the middle of chapter eight and we're in verse 19. Um, would someone else like to read? I can read it. Okay, Mary, what, what book are you reading from? I'm reading from the woman's Bible, the woman's devotional Bible. Okay, New International Version. Got yeah. it. Great. Okay. Verse uh, 19 to the end of the chapter. Okay. The Lord also said to Moses, this is the offering Aaron and his sons are to bring to the Lord on the day he is anointed. A tenth of the ephod of fine flour as a regular grain offering, half of it in the morning and half in the evening. Prepare it with oil on a griddle. Bring it well mixed and present the grain offering broken in pieces as an aroma pleasing the Lord. Wait, I gotta, okay. Um, the son who is to succeed him as an anointed priest shall prepare it. It is the Lord's regular share and is to be burned completely. Every grain offering of a priest shall be burned completely. It must not be eaten. The Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron and his sons, these are the regulations for the sin offering. The sin offering is to be slaughtered before the Lord in the place of the burnt offering is slaughtered. It is most holy. The priest who offers it shall eat it, and it is to be eaten in a holy place in the courtyard of the tent of meeting. Whatever touches any of the flesh will become holy. And if any of the blood is splattered on a garment, you must wash it in a holy place. The clay pot the meat is cooked in must, must be broken. But if it is cooked in a bronze pot, the pot is to be scoured and rinsed with water. Any male in the priest's family may eat it. It is most holy, but any sin offering whose blood is brought into the tent of meeting to make atonement in the holy place must not be eaten. It must be burned. Fantastic. It's interesting how sometimes the priests can eat it and sometimes they can't eat it. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes it has to be totally burnt and then sometimes it's Oh, yeah, that's part of their do. So there clearly I, was a disagreement about what to eat or not to eat that led to getting this down in writing. Um, I think is the, the, the probably the way to think of this. And you might have had priests from some slightly different traditions arguing. Um, you know, I, um, I had a guest 
priest here on Sunday. A lot of you didn't see it because it was a private baptism, which by the way, we have um, kind of a special dispensation due to COVID to be able to do. And so we don't have too many crowds in our churches. And if we had done this baptism at 1030, which would have been ideal and the family and I talked about this months ago, it would have been together with our people, given the day that it was, you know, just too many people in the room. Um, to really, to really like encourage, I should say, if we accidentally get 70 people in the room, you know, thanks be to God. Um, so we did it at noon and the guest priest was Justin Bernbrock's father, who was Episcopal priest. And he did, he and I had to work out who was doing what, right? And we both have, even though we're both Episcopal priests and we both have seminary training, we do a, things a little differently and we have slight theological differences at the minute level of when is an efficient an efficient and when is a when is somebody you know does that make sense like we're just little things there now imagine five thousand years ago somebody comes into my sacristy and says you can't eat that <laughs> that's kind of what's going on here and i go why i've always eaten that way you know think of the one in family feud that's just the way we've always done it the, the biggest church buzzword phrase of all time. Um, so I think you can safely assume there was a disagreement and then there had to be a little bit of a council, just like how we got the Nicene Creed and so we need a compromise here. And so that's why you have all these details about who eats what and how and where and why so that, um, so that somebody can point to a reference and say, oh yeah, well, the Torah says you're doing this wrong by the way. And they go, oh, you're right. So. But in the previous chapter, it says, um, whatever you, whenever you live, you must not eat any fat or any blood. Yeah. And that was at the end of chapter three. Yeah. Yeah. Well, here they're telling you to, to eat the blood. Exactly. Inconsistent. It's right there. I mean, so again, I would take this to a somewhat a fundamentalist and say, how do you explain this, right? Um, and they would change the question, you know. The Lord says, don't argue with me or something like that. <laughs> God says, don't question his scripture, you know, and that, well, that's a cop out. Um, but you're right. It's just, it's, there's always, it's just, it's riddled with these inconsistencies. Riddled with inconsistencies. All right, I'm gonna take the reins and read chapter seven in its entirety, just so we can get through it. So that next week we can start a new subject, even though it's still gonna be, you know, kind of aimed at instructions for the priests. So here's chapter seven. I'm reading from Robert Alter's Hebrew Bible, the five books of Moses, Robert Alter. Okay. A very academic book, really worth it too. And this is the teaching of the guilt offering. It is holy of holies. In this place where they slaughter the burnt offering, they shall slaughter the guilt offering and its blood shall be cast on the altar all around. A lot of you probably say, if you don't say guilt offering, it might say sin offering. And all of its fat shall be brought forward, the broad tail and the fat covering the innards and two kidneys and the fat that is on them, which is over the loins and the lobe on the liver together with the kidneys it shall be removed time out remember i like to do this clap i remember when i was in choir in beverly hills the choir master would stop because we're singing has anybody been in a choir where the choir master just goes stop right yeah so i asked you to get him to stop all right so stop right there and remember what i said earlier in the little slides um this is this is part of all prehistoric I don't know if it's a prehistoric and antiquity. Um, so ancient societies were slaughtering things, and they some of them were reading messages like you would read tea leaves or tarot cards. They were reading messages from the gods in the way that they cut open a stomach and how things spilled out. You know, it spilled out a certain way, it meant good fortune, spilled, spilled out a different way. I know it's disgusting, but remember, while that does not apply to Israel because that's not what their God's interested in. It's not their tradition. It is still in the ethos, you know, it's still around. It's kind of like doing how they do chants at, in the Pittsburgh Steelers stadium is different than how they do chants at the bears 
but if you're a bear fan and you're in Pittsburgh, you better kind of behave yourself, right? So same kind of concept a little bit. That's kind of a weird analogy, but work with me here. I often think of football and the way pe people we behave, behave in, in terms of rooting for football teams is very much akin to how we behave in church, but that's a sermon for another time. Uh, <laughs> probably very soon since we're in football season. All of its fat shall be rough. So all of these things they're talking about here are just part of, you know, they're used to everyone else in the world dealing with the, the way the entrails come out um, with some kind of intentionality. So that's just a little bit in the background here. The priest shall turn the smoke on the altar, a fire offering for the Lord. It is a guilt offering. Any male among the priests may eat it. Now that's a funny way to say that because all the priests are male anyway. In a holy place, it shall be eaten. It is holy of holies. The offense offering, like the sin offering, a single teaching do they have, which is the priest who atones through it, his shall it be. And the priest bringing forward a man's burnt offering, the hide of the burnt offering that the priest brought forward is the priest's, his it shall be. And every grain offering that is baked in an oven and everything made in a pan and on a griddle is the priest's who brings it forward, his it shall be. And every grain offering mixed with oil and dry shall be for all the sons of Aaron, each man of them alike. This means a little, we're getting into a bit of the word vicarious, which is what my old title used to be, vicar. I'm, I was not vicarious of Christ, but I was vicarious of the bishop in serving your community before I became the rector and now I'm, now I'm uh, afloat. Um, the word vicarious means taking something on that belongs to somebody else, right? Or taking an ownership on. Here you get how that's part of the Levitical priesthood and which is still part of the priesthood in some way. When I do a absolution on Sunday, that is in many ways me being vicarious of God. I hate to say that like that, but it's really more of I'm vicarious of I'm, I am collecting the sins of the community, whatever they may be, and I'm giving them up to God, right? Similar thing here, the priest are taking on physically the burnt offering. And as they go and put it on the altar to do their sacrifice, that sin is no longer the person that gave it to the priest. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So in many ways, the priest is in this way, doing a little bit of a vicarious, I've taken on your sins. And you better hope that the priest wants to burn this stuff as quickly as human possible, humanly possible so they don't get blamed for something horrible, right? And this is the teaching of the communion sacrifice that is brought forward to the Lord. If in thanksgiving he brings it forward, he shall bring forward with the thanksgiving sacrifice flat cakes mixed in oil and flat cake wafers coated with oil and cakes of semolina soaked through mixed with oil. With cakes of leavened bread, he shall bring forward his offering with his thanksgiving communion sacrifice and he shall bring forward from it one kind of each offering a levy to the Lord interesting use of that word for the priest casting the blood of the communion sacrifice his it shall be and the flesh of his thanksgiving communion sacrifice shall be eaten on the day of its offering he shall not leave anything of it till the morning and if his offering is a votive votive or a free will offering on this day he brings forward his sacrifice it shall be eaten and on the morrow what is left of it may be eaten and what is left of the flesh of the sacrifice on the third day shall be burned in fire and if some of the flesh of his communion sacrifice should indeed be eaten on the third day, it will not be acceptable. He who brings it forth, it will not be reckoned for him. It is desecrated meat, and the person eating of it will bear his guilt. And the flesh that touches anything unclean shall not be eaten, and fire it shall be burned. And other flesh, whoever is clean, may eat the flesh. And the person who eats flesh from the communion sacrifice, which is the Lord's and his uncleanness is upon him, that person shall be cut off from his kin. And should a person touch anything unclean through human uncleanness or an unclean beast or any unclean abominable creature and eat of the flesh of the communion sacrifice, which is the Lord's, that person shall be cut off from his kin. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the Israelites, saying, No fat of the ox or sheep or goat shall you eat, and the fat of the beast that has died and the fat of the beast torn by the predators may be used for any task, but it by no means shall be eaten. So again, Mary, it's it's arguing with itself. It's it keeps changing the goalposts a little bit about 
when to eat fat or not. For who, uh, let's see, cut up from skin. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the Israelites saying, he who brings forward his communion sacrifice to the Lord shall bring his offering to the Lord from his communion sacrifice. His own hands shall bring the fire offerings of the Lord, the fat together with the breast he shall bring it, the breast to elevate as an elevation offering before the Lord. And the priest shall turn the breast into smoke on the altar, and the breast shall be Aaron's and his sons. And the right thigh you shall give as a levy to the priest from the communion sacrifices. He of the sons of Aaron who bring forward the blood of the communion sacrifices and the fat, his shall be the right thigh as a share. For the breast of the elevation offering and the thigh of the levy I have taken from the Israelites from their communion sacrifices and have given them to Aaron the priest and to his sons as a perpetual portion from the Israelites. This is the allotment of Aaron and the allotment of his sons from the fire offerings of the Lord from the day they were brought forward to be priests to the Lord, which the Lord charged to give them from the day they were anointed from the Israelites, a perpetual statute for their generations. This is the teaching for the burnt offering, for the grain offering, for the offense offering, and for the guilt offering, and for the installation offering, and for the communion sacrifice, which the Lord charged Moses on Mount Sinai on the day he charged the Israelites to bring forward their sacrifices to the Lord in the wilderness of Sinai. End thought. So there you go. Chapter one through seven, all one giant, the Lord says, or and literally the Lord said to Moses. So in turn, Moses told the people, according to the tradition, I've already issued that I'm skeptical that that's how it came to be. And it's more things that were already happening that they kind of wrote back in, not to negate that there was a tradition that Moses at one point said these things, but I don't think Moses literally said all of these things because some of these things don't make sense. And some of these things are frighteningly specific. Okay. Who's hungry? <laughs> Who wants some barbecue? Uh, Barb, you got a question? Nope. Uh, no, Jan just texted me and she had to leave because she has a contractor coming. She just wanted to say goodbye to everybody. Oh, no problem. I was just going to say that it depends on where you're from about what barbecue means because sometimes it's now. Yeah, that's and right. Sometimes, sometimes, it's, sometimes it's a verb. verb. Hey, how about, you know, the Bible says, I'm going to, I'm going to take it out of context for you. The Bible says the breast meat is the best meat of the, of the animal. I, I know a lot of people that would take issue with that, <laughs> but it seems to say here that the first, the most important meat is the breast. And then the next meat is the right thigh. No mention of the left thigh. Is it <laughs> just to eat that? You know, it's interesting because I was reading the common English version and that says the ribs rather than the breast meat. Oh, interesting. Oh. Though so I think there's a textual problem with the word and how you translate it. And I think, mm -hmm. or, it, you know, what actually the word is, the various translators, including this guy, and the Common English Bible is very recent too. They are both um, saying the same thing, but using different examples. Common English Bible might be saying the rib is the most desirable meat, according to Israel. And Robert Alter is saying the breast is the most desirable meat. And I don't know if he's picking, I'd have to do some research to say, if he, did he pick breast because the breast is the, in, in the Western world, the most desirable meat, or is it? <laughs> um, who knows? But they're, I think they're trying to say the most expensive meat or the most yeah. desirable meat. And who hasn't gone to fried chicken and go, God, I wish the breasts weren't more, uh, double the cost of the thighs, but there you go, more meat. I like that. I like thighs. So. There you go, yes. <laughs> I do too. So does Indian cuisine, which I've started cooking more of. There you go. They're on to something. All right. Now I've set you up for lunch and I will send you on your way and next week. Go get some meats or substitute. And uh, next week we're going to talk entirely about um, what uh, God expects out of these uh, Aaron and his sons and their Levitical priesthood. So that'll be fun. It's, I swear, by the way, not, no pun intended, it's going to get juicier as we go on. If you're kind of plotting through here, it, there's going to be some good stuff to chew on in a little bit, pun intended. All right. Take care, everybody. Thanks for being here. Bye. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.